Well, we are in a series which is looking at the last seven days of Jesus' life. And today uh, we are looking at that Sunday, that Sunday that leads into the last week, which traditionally on the church calendar is called Palm Sunday. And I know that that comes later in the year, but, or later in this season, but, but we're looking specifically today, and next week we'll look at Monday, then we'll look at Tuesday, the Sunday after that, all the way into what we'll call Holy Week, which um, ultimately the High Holy Days, I should say, which would be Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. So today, we, we come to the point, and our altar table, as I shared last week, has been adorned to, to represent for us and to celebrate the things that we would see in this season. And last week, when we looked at the passage out of Luke where Jesus' eyes resolutely set upon uh, the city of Jerusalem, I pointed out this, this stone here to talk about that. Well, today, uh, we are that Sunday, which we, call, which we would call Palm Sunday. And uh, we see in the Scripture that uh, the people are waving the palms as Jesus is entering in. And there's some significant things that come about, the reasons for that, that I want us to understand as, as we look at that. But, but as we begin this, this morning, I want to take us a little bit on a journey here with uh, Google Maps because I want you to see what that morning's journey looked like as uh, Jesus and his disciples um, set out on that road from Jericho to Jerusalem. This is the 16-mile journey that they would have taken. Just look at all these hills and the peaks and valleys and the mountains and the treacherous plains there. It would have taken about six hours, but um, you can see how difficult this would have been. Ultimately, where that little gold dome is there, that, that represents the third um, holiest Muslim shrine today, which is the Dome of the Rock, which actually sits where the old temple did. But when Jesus got to the Mount of Olives on that Palm Sunday, he would have looked in and seen the great city of Jerusalem and focusing upon, most specifically, uh, the temple, his father's house, and, and knowing that that's where his mission and ministry uh, would take him at that particular moment. So on Palm Sunday, or that particular time of Sunday, we really need to answer three questions that I think really beg to, to, for us to know as we study and as we look into what it means uh, to be a part of understanding what this teaching is. Uh, the questions would go something like this, as to why did Jesus ride in on a donkey? We'll look at that. We'll look at a second one, it's, which is why did he weep? And the last one that we'll look at is, is why, did, um, why did Jesus turn over things in the temple when, when he went into that? So let's look at this first piece, because I think in order to really understand the whys, we need to understand the whats. So, so the question is why? Why did Jesus ride in on a donkey? Well, it obviously supports a historical note. We know that all throughout biblical history, whenever kings or when conquerors came into the city of Jerusalem, they would always be riding on the back of a donkey. We see that all throughout biblical history. We see significant things that would come from this, and most importantly, this would be what was flagged by the prophet um, Zechariah. Zechariah writes this in 14.4, on that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem. So we see in the story that Luke tells us that Jesus has prearranged this cult. He has already made provisions so that he sends the disciples knowing that they will find it exactly where he had made these arrangements to be. But what follows this journey into Jerusalem, so to speak, really flows exactly what Zechariah said prophetically um, even earlier in chapter 9. Here's what he says. This is the message translation. Shout and cheer, daughter Zion. Uh, raise the roof, daughter Jerusalem. Your king is coming. A good king who makes all things right. A humble king riding on a donkey. A mere colt of a donkey. Uh, I've had it with war. No more chariots in Ephraim. No more wars in Jerusalem. No more swords and spears, bows and arrows. But he will offer peace to the nations, a peaceful rule worldwide from the four winds to the seven seas. Now, the waving of these palms would have been reminiscent to things that happened historically. Now, 165 years before Jesus was born, uh, we know that something significant happened in this region that we know as Jerusalem. Antiochus Epiphanes was the Seleucid king, and he came into this territory and overtook Jerusalem, overtook their culture, overtook everything. In fact, what he did was he placed a heavy emphasis from the Seleucids at that time, and he said to the people of Judaism, you will 
no longer be able to worship as you usually do. You will no longer be able to praise God the way that you do. In fact, you need to take on the gods of all the Greeks and, and all of those kinds of teachings. And this made the people of Judaism raving mad, as you can imagine. And Antiochus Epiphanes uh, was so bent on conquering them that he even came in and he performed some um, unholy sacrifices on the holy altar um, of Jerusalem at that particular time. So the Seleucids reigned all over Jerusalem and Israel and Judah for many, many, many periods of time until a time called the Maccabean um, uh, timetable. And that's where Judas and Simon Maccabee came in and they began to liberate Judaism once again. And we find out that as uh, Judas and Simon Maccabee come in to Jerusalem on that particular case, as they begin to push the influence of the Seleucids out of that region, what happens? Well, the people gather as Simon and later on as Judas came in and they began to wave palms and they began to throw their cloaks and their clothing down upon the ground, recognizing in their presence were liberators, were soon to be kings and people that they uh, could worship at that particular point. So we see some significant things as to what would be leading into Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. We also see in 1 Kings a reference where King David talks about something very similar as he anoints his son Solomon king. And here it is in 1 Kings 1 verses 33 to 35. The king who was David said to them, Take your Lord's servants with you and get Solomon, my son, um, on my mule and take him down to Gihon. And there have Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel. Blow the trumpet and shout, Long live King Solomon! And then you are to go up with him, and he is to come and to sit on my throne and reign in my place. I have appointed him ruler of, over all Judah and Israel. So Luke, in, in his proclamation of what happens on that Palm Sunday, is reminiscing and pulling back the ancient Hebrew traditions and helping us to understand why the people are doing what they did. We also see a reference uh, again in the Old Testament in 2 Kings 9, where it says, they hurried and took their cloaks, they spread them under him on the bare steps, and they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is the king. Again, this was a way of showing reverence and a way of showing submission to a king or a conqueror who is coming into the particular territory. So on that last Sunday of Jesus' life, we see something significant happen here. We see that the people are taking on the same culture and customs that they had known for centuries, if not hundreds of years, um, in the significance of that. But what they did not recognize was that Jesus coming as the Messiah was not coming as the liberator. He was not coming as a Messiah of war, but he was coming as a Messiah of peace. And they would not welcome that as they saw that. So Jesus definitely is a king. And part of his riding in on a donkey is to fulfill what the scripture would say. Now the people will call attention to the fact that he's riding symbolically in. Some would say, well, why did, why did he choose to do that right at the Mount of Olives as he came into Jerusalem? You know, he certainly did not use this animal as, a, as an easy trans. Uh, uh, means of transportation, he got on it at the very last moment for that triumphant entry as they came in. So Jesus, we find out, he's not an ordinary king at all. In fact, uh, he's a king of fishermen, tax collectors, Samaritans, harlots, blind men, demoniacs, cripples, and in fact, in, in, in even more uh, realistic terms, the subjects of Jesus' kingdom are all ragtag uh, misfits. We are sinners. We are ragtag misfits. We are a part of his kingdom. And, and his kingdom represents the grand hope of our desires and our dreams. So that day as Jesus is riding into Jerusalem, these are not cloaks and garments that are made of fine linens and fine silks and expensive wares. These are actually the cloaks that are sweat-stained from the days. They are cloaks and shawls that are tattered and dusty. The common person is laying these down as a sign of their reverence and their wanting to welcome in this liberator, this king, this Jesus, uh, who is proclaiming to be the anointed one, the Messiah. 
So the people come out in droves. Why? Because they have heard of Jesus' teachings. Many have seen of his healing miracles. They've been captivated by, by who Jesus is and what he represents, and they want to be a part of this kingdom's purpose, and they truly believe of all things, of all the messiahs who had come before him, that he would be the one that would liberate them from the grasp of Rome. But here's what happened. As Jesus begins to unfold his purpose, as he comes into Jerusalem, those same people that are shouting Hosanna, that are throwing their cloaks, that are waving the palms to recognize this king, this conqueror then, are really going to be asking the question, what happened? Why isn't this guy the person that we really thought he was? Why can't we have someone finally to redeem Israel? Now I want you to think about that for a second. And that's a great question for us to ask because sometimes we find ourselves getting into this. You know, for the people that gathered that day, their entire hope was built upon the back of, someone, uh, of, a, of a donkey carrying a person who was a common man. Someone that we know was both divine and human, but for them, they saw him as the common person. So the people's hopes was totally on that. If Jesus had only seized the moment, some would think, if the people of Jerusalem had only acted in the way that we who have read the end of the story understand it, if they had only acted in the way which we felt would have been appropriate, it could have come and gone into so many different ways. And yet God was going to fulfill the hopes and the dreams of his people in a powerful way. And the question would be, would the people observe what God was doing? So often what happens is we want to put God in a box. Sometimes we have the high hopes of being liberated with with a disease or with a financial mishap or a relational flaw or whatever the cases are. We, We want to be liberated from those things only to find that the very Jesus that we call upon to rescue us and to liberate us from our pain, our persecution, our anomalies, whatever it is, we find at that moment that perhaps the answer, the solution, and the way that he provides is not what we expect. We find ourselves in those times where we have those great problems to be liberated, and all of a sudden there are moments when we can even tread on that ground that says, is Jesus truly the liberator of the transgressions, the challenges, and the problems that exist in my life? Life is filled with many moments of what things that might have been. Moments when everything seems right, but, but then there's just um, uh, nothing happens the way that we had hoped. And, and it can be so hard at times still believing in a God when we have these high hopes that if we just pray, that if we just honor the, um, uh, the ways of our faith, that God will come in and rescue us and provide us the solution that we seek, only to find out that we hedge upon danger, asking and seeking and begging God to give us the outcome that we choose to be right. God is mysterious. God does not always do what we ask. God is always, though, about to do something powerful and wonderful. And we, his disciples of today, just as the disciples of the past, as well as the disciples of the future, we must know that the story of Jerusalem leads to a conclusion that is totally built upon hope, that is the answer to every prayer that we seek, that will set us on the path the path that leads us closer to the very one who created us. But the people that day, their imaginations were boxed in and they could only imagine liberation from Rome and that was the peace. And you and I must step back from that. And we must see that God's mission is far bigger than that. You see, sometimes it's so easy to fixate in our minds false images of, of a Lord that we want to worship. We create these images in our mind of a, of a king that, that we want to worship, and we claim him to be our Christ, our Lord and our king. But in those ways in which we create that God in which we want to worship, we say that that God must bless us and put down our enemies. We say that that God must lift us up while not giving a break to those that we fight against. We say that that God must do all good things for us and no one else because we want to put God in a box. And the significant things that we see here is 
that God does not promise us good health. God does not promise us prosperity. God does not promise us a life without trial and tribulation and trouble. God does not promise us a life without disease. God does not promise us lives in bro- without broken relationships. We see these happening in everything and in everywhere in which we turn. But here's what God does promise. God says that in the midst of of all of those uncertainties, I will be your liberator. But the liberation will come by the way in which he has planned. And that's the hope that we have to hold on to. And that's the peace to know that this kingdom that Jesus is speaking about as he comes and rolls into Israel on the back, into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, he is broadcasting that this kingdom belongs to a different kind of king that it belongs to God himself. Here's the second question that we really have to answer today. Why did Jesus weep? It says there, Luke records it, he is on the fringe of coming into Jerusalem and he begins weeping. A lot of uh, ink has gone on paper to, to talk about why was Jesus weeping. I went through and started searching a lot of the scriptures to find out how often did Jesus weep, and I only found two places where that is. And the first one was that Jesus begins to weep upon the death of his friend Lazarus. And, and some will say, well, why was he weeping then? Well, Jesus was really getting into tune of what death was. And, and, and some would say that he was weeping, that his friends were weeping over the death of their loved one. Others would say that he was weeping because he knew that they couldn't see yet the glorious thing that would come, that death is not the end, that life was coming through resurrection. The second place that he weeps is right here with Luke where Luke says that upon looking down upon all of Jerusalem, Jesus begins to weep. Why? Why does he weep then? Well, he's weeping probably for a couple of reasons. One might be that that he's weeping because he's he's hurting because the people refuse to see him as the Messiah, that they're just going to blow it off and they're going to say, there's just another one. There's there's another false Messiah who's not going to do what we've been asking God to do. So he's weeping over that. But he's also weeping because he sees the end result. He sees that the choices that people will make oftentimes lead to destruction and not to happiness or peace or completion. The choices that we choose to make often will lead to destructive things, will often lead us into sinful behavior. And in this particular place, he was, seeing for, he was foretelling that in 70 A.D., Jerusalem would be ransacked by Rome. Jesus is saying that there are two paths for which we must choose. There is the narrow path, And there is the wider path. The narrow path is the difficult path. It's the one that's filled with a lot of uh, challenges and troubles and things that knock us off of our feet. It's a painful path. It's not one that brings joy all the time. But what happens on that path leads us into a closer relationship with God. The wider path is the one that so often gets chosen. It's the easier path. It looks sexy. It draws us in. It entices us. It entangles us. And it invites us in and says, if you will just compromise who you are, if you will forget about what I'm teaching you, if you will just go the easier way, then then all of these things will be easier. But Jesus is sitting there on that donkey saying that that wider path will lead to destruction. Here's what it says in the message out of Mark. Don't look for shortcuts to God, Jesus speaking. The market is flooded with surefire, easygoing formulas for a successful life that can be practiced in your spare time. Don't fall for that stuff, even though crowds of people do. In other words, don't do it just because everybody else is doing it. The way to life to God is vigorous and requires total attention. The wider path, where did it lead? Jesus is riding in as a man of peace. They want a warrior. They want a liberator. And he says, that's not me. There's a different way. I am not coming to conquer Rome by sword. I'm not coming to conquer it by bow or by spear or by arrow. I'm coming to conquer it in peace. And what we see is in 66 A.D., 
Jerusalem and the people of uh, Jerusalem began to rise up against Rome. And during that time between around 65 AD and 70 AD, about three additional messiahs, quote unquote, rise up. And what do they do? They call upon the Hebrew people to take up arms, to fight and to try to destroy Rome, that they no longer want taxes, they no longer want conscription, they no longer want Rome occupying their land. Let's take it back. And they do it by brute force. And what we learn in that is that in the third attempt, things became so agitated by a Roman general who became emperor not long after that that he sent in the 10th legion which was Rome's most fierce fighting soldiers and they slaughtered over a million Jewish men women and children to squish the uprising Jesus sees this as he's coming into Jerusalem and he's saying that wider path that you're going to choose, I'm weeping because it's not going to lead to peace. It's going to lead to destruction and you must take a path of peace because because destruction leads to nowhere. And he says that the narrow path is what we must seek. Jesus' teachings take us into that narrow path, don't they? He says, turn the other cheek. He says that that, that when your enemy comes and and tells you to carry their their pack for them, don't just carry it for a mile, carry it what? An extra mile. He says that, that we must give up our cloaks to those that need it. He's coming in and he's teaching a different kind of thing. Why? Because he knows that his purpose of coming is different than what the people will expect. And his weeping details out quite simply that Israel will fall because they refuse to take the path to peace. We see this today. Look at the Middle East today. We see the unrest. Israel is pushing the Palestinians and and trying to take back land from them and trying to to oppress them. And what are the Palestinians doing? They're becoming suicide bombers. And they go and they blow up uh, Israeli uh, soldiers in camps and encampments and those things. They fire missiles back and forth. Israel responds back out of war rather than peace and goes and starts killing Palestinians. And the more Palestinians being killed, what's happening? The more bombers that are being developed. And this war continues on and on and on and on. And what it tells us is, as Jesus said, the only way that there can be peace is to actually not be at war. And he calls the people to be in peace. Here's the third question. Why does Jesus cleanse the temple? It's a great question. Imagine as he's coming in, He gets into the temple courts and the people are gathering around and they're thinking, okay, our rabbi, our leader, our warrior is going to give this mighty battle cry and we're going to arm ourselves and we're finally going to overtake Rome again. But Jesus instead comes in and he starts turning over the tables in the temple and he begins to cause mayhem and begins to cause chaos. Why is he doing this? Because he understands what's happening to the poor. In those days, the people needed two things when they came into the temple to make a sacrifice. They needed an unblemished animal, and they needed money to transition into temple currency. The temple could not accept the the money of the common person because it had a graven image on it. So you had to go and and have an exchange and exchange your currency that had Caesar's uh, face on it for temple currency. Same thing with the doves. The doves was primarily the instrument of sacrifice that a poor person would use. They couldn't afford a lamb or a ram or, or anything like that. They, they, they had doves. But here was, the, here was the pinch. The pinch was that, that it had to be a dove that was certified to be unblemished. And you couldn't just bring a dove from your regions walking through the desert, that 16-mile journey or whatever the case was, that the only way that they would accept the dove was you had to buy it from the temple exchanger because it was a certified, unblemished dove, and the priest would only accept that. Do you get what's going on here? And Jesus is raving mad. Those dove would cost 13 days' wages to the average person. The exchange rate and and giving up their currency for the monies that they had earned uh, through through their employment and into temple tax was three days' wages. And sometimes those scales with the exchange rate just weren't proper enough. 
And Jesus is raving mad, and he says, this is ridiculous. And he turns over, uh, turns over these things, and we begin to see some, some, some significant things happening here. It comes out of Mark 11. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area, and he began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and benches of all those selling doves, and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this, and they began looking for a way to kill him. They feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. If we learn anything at all today on Jesus riding in on Palm Sunday, we have to know this, that riding in on a donkey boldly proclaims he is the Messiah. That coming in says that he is the one, the anointed one, the chosen one, who will deliver the people of God. He also is demonstrating that he does not come by sword, he does not come by spear, he does not come by bow and arrow, but he comes as a God, as a Messiah of peace. The meaning of Palm Sunday is to clearly place before us the mission and the role of the church. And it's to place before us God's people, that we are to be instruments of peace. If we aren't a church calling for peace, then we aren't the church at all. The world around us hungers for peace, not just peace, but true peace. And today, as we place ourselves at this moment of Jesus entering into Jerusalem, it's a reminder that we, too, must cast aside our preconceived understanding and notions of what the Messiah's true role is. And we need to see that Jesus, the Messiah, today, even today, still weeps over a broken world, still weeps over our broken families, still weeps over our broken church. And he calls for us to live into what he is. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the King of Kings. And he is the Lord of Lords.